gonna achieve sustainability if we make innovations that are good enough so they are mass accepted by everyone without having to impose anything and without creating costs which are unbearable for the uh, the countries which are in economic development like Brazil or India. Innovation technology is in the mobility sector related to motorsport. That was the my, my thesis which I I embraced and trying to see in which areas I could uh, work around that to promote as fast as possible in the best way possible. Aloha, and welcome to another episode of the Groundswell Origins podcast, where I connect you to outstanding humans and sustainable ideas. I'm your host, Scott Martin. Today, we're going to be meeting with Lucas DeGrassi, who is an innovator. Um, he's a leader in sustainability, and uh, you know he's a world champion Formula E and Formula One, and and uh, just overall racing champion, innovator, designer. Uh, he's considered one of the most cons- uh, successful Brazilian drivers of the decade. Um, he's also been named the best endurance driver in the world for Formula E, and just so many different accolades uh, for him. Not to mention, I mean, this guy has uh, not just a good race car driver and innovator. Um, he's a great businessman and understands marketing. We're going to go deep dive into marketing. He founded, um, was a member of the board of the CEO of uh, Robo Race, something we'll tell you a little bit more about. Uh, he's been, in, uh, you know, innovating within Formula E and helping really bring that industry and blossom. We talked about how he markets and, and really started marketing that industry. Um, he also started another industry, e-scooter championship, which is a, a e-scooter uh, championship racing. Um, founded a, a summit called Zero Summit, and you know he's been for years working with audio and innovation design, and now now he has moved on to new things. So, without further ado, let's paddle in. We're here in another episode of Groundswell, and we're here with the one and only paddling in with Lucas DeGrassi. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for for the invitation. Pleasure to be here. Uh, It's been, I'm so pumped to have this. I mean, I think you and I first talked about a year and a half ago, actually, um, and you were quite busy traveling. I was trying to uh, hopefully get you on. So I'm really excited that we had the window of opportunity to get you. Um, A lot of people that are listening are probably not familiar with their background, and I'm curious if... um, you got such an incredible uh, history in in motorsports. If you can give a little bit of that background, and then I want to do a deep dive in some of these incredible innovations and marketing and things that you've been doing that I think are just like, you know, next to none. So would you mind just sharing with us a little bit about your history and a little bit of your background in racing? Well, first of all, thank you very much. I'm just trying to, uh, yeah, innovate in, in my own small field of motorsport, but uh yeah, so I'm. I was. I was born in Brazil. Grew up there. Um, had a dream of becoming Formula One driver because of, you know, Ayrton Senna um, and the legacy that he he left in Brazil. And when he died, I was quite young. And I did. I was Formula Three World Champion, then Formula Two uh, Vice World Champion. Then I went to Formula One. I did a few years in Formula One. Then I did uh, uh, endurance racing in Le Mans with hybrid cars. Uh, at the top level category, did three podiums in four races uh, for Audi. Then Audi decided to stop that and to focus on electric, um, which was already running a little bit in parallel because I helped to co-found Formula E with Alejandro Gag in 2014. Uh, then I started racing Formula E, uh, which is basically uh, IndyCar or Formula One car, but with battery uh, and an electric motor. Race there, uh, still racing there. After seven years, I won the the, the, the third season, uh, became uh, champion in 2017, and uh, I in 2015 also I started uh, uh, helped to start a different project, which was to accelerate the, the, the autonomous racing through uh, autonomous driving through racing. So we started a project called Robo Race, which is still ongoing. It's part of the Arrival Group. 
Uh, last year, I started uh, to get, I co-founded and I started together with other partners the first world championship for electric mobi- uh, for micro mobility for scooters, um, the electric scooter championship. So yeah, um, trying to use I'm a shareholder in Extreme E as well, which is happening uh, as we speak in uh, in the in Alula in Saudi. But the, my my main background is uh, my main the the main history of my career is that I've been I became a Formula One driver, professional driver, and during these ten years of my professional career from 25 to 35, I've seen the motorsport going from pure combustion to pure electric autonomous racing. And I'm super proud to have been part of this transition and have pushed the boundaries of technology there. And if by if we made any difference in pers- people's perception or technology development in any of these areas, has been already a huge advance for the world towards a, a better future. And that's what I really uh, always wanted to achieve with my career to to push uh, the boundaries of the sport that I love and to 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 bring back. Uh, to society, good values uh, and good development and good technology from the world of motorsport. And this is what I've been trying to do for the past, uh, yeah, 20 years or so. Well, your career is unbelievably outstanding. I mean, you are, um, you know, you've been, like, you think if you just did one of those innovations, that would be massive. Um, Like when I first met you, I saw you brought in the robo uh, car we're at we did the uh, energy disruptors in calgary yeah um and uh, you brought in one of those cars and then you had this great video explaining this whole story so people that are listening um he basically and this is actually what initiated we'll get into the other areas shortly but this is what initiated my my interest in, in talking with you is you're marketing a whole new category of motorsport and introducing something which i was curious if there was pushback from people that were traditionalists uh, in combustion and seeing, let alone electric, let alone robo. So I was curious <laughs> about a couple things. So let's just talk about the robo, um, the journey there a little bit, and and maybe describe to people I've never heard of it. What is it? Robo race um, was initially uh, conceived by a very very smart man called Denis Zverdlov, which is the CEO and founder of Arrival Group. Arrival just has just got listed on the Nasdaq uh, one week ago. Uh, on a valuation of something over ten billion dollars, and um, which an arrival and Robo Race were were founded in the same at the same time. So in 2015, and and Robo Race was kind of the arm of arrival for autonomous vehicles. But suddenly, uh, Dennis saw, and I was together with Dennis at the very beginning. He saw that uh, one way of pushing the boundaries of autonomous vehicles, because everybody was developing it from like bottom up the, the his approach was okay let's develop the fastest ever car available electric and autonomous and then trying to make it work top down let's see what what are the challenges that an autonomous car faces or let's try to build an algorithm for an autonomous car that can beat the world's best driver so it's almost like imagine that today's chess software can beat anyone at any time, but it takes a supercomputer to beat a grandmaster. So what Dennis wanted to do with autonomous racing was very similar, to, to build a, a, a robust enough, uh, an adaptive enough algorithm that could beat the world's elite driver. Actually, we still have this challenge today. As we speak, we started back in 2015, and every six months, I measure myself against the, the, the algorithm, and uh, we started with a 15% difference 20 percent algorithms lower and now we're getting it 3.2 3.4 depending on the conditions depending on how um which track we are we are we are racing so um th- that's the concept of robo race top-down development of autonomous uh, technologies and the use of competition to uh, to advance faster uh, the the algorithm because of, of course if you if you develop something on the streets it needs to be extremely safe extremely uh, regulated and so on in a racetrack you just can push as quick as you can if the car spins and crash there is a financial loss but in the end the development is very quick and now with Robo Race after now we are in season beta um, we have developed incredible partnerships with Stanford Carnegie Mellon. 
uh, with the University of Pisa, Zurich, uh, London, um, Imperial College, and so on. So uh, all these different PhDs and technologies and ways of building this, this algorithm, they are racing together, but at the same time, because they are racing, they are kind of developing and progressing with the algorithm. So, so it's, it's a very interesting project that has, has been going. If you want to check it out, it's roborace.com. And if you're really involved into uh, machine learning, reinforcement learning, uh, AI, uh, coding, and motorsport as well, uh, send us an email and uh, we'll be more than happy to, to see how we can integrate stuff. Amazing. So if I'm listening to this and, I'm, and I've never heard this, I'm like, the first question when I first uh, saw you and I spoke with you about this is going, well, is this going to be like Formula One like robot, like, do you think that it's going to have uh, a reception where people want to watch this, and this becomes a uh, almost like a, a sponsored, you know, world tour or something like that, or is this just about innovation itself? That was the initial idea, but as as I can see, it's steered, at least at the moment, towards much more of a R and D platform than entertainment. Although, because of the the, the capacities of the car. We are experimenting and using a lot of augmented reality on track. So some of the races are not pure races that who goes faster, who go, who wins. But you have to go through these augmented reality gates that are placed on the racetrack that only the autonomous software algorithm can see. Um, we can we have different challenges of precision of um, of. Um, going, for example, um, going uphill in Goodwood, so something completely new. We are looking at uh, very precise different methods of making the algorithm with GPS, machine, uh, computer vision only, um, and, and and many other Just stuff. Constant innovation. Trying. Yeah. Yeah. So what if, like, have you seen that Netflix series about Formula One? Yes. I almost think that that's there could be a series of the innovation like behind the scenes because when you're telling me that I'm just like fascinated with all the different. <laughs> we, are like, do, we are doing something like this. We are doing. Oh, this. are you? Called, okay. Yeah, yeah. Tell us are, about we, it. Yeah, so we are we are doing this. It's called uh, um, uh, Lucas Lucas versus AI, uh, and um, Sweet. so we are recording since the very early stages of when we started doing this, and every test, every race we do together, every uh, challenge. We get recorded. We get to we, we show exactly what's happening, and we're gonna compile that into a, a documentary or a series in the future. But we, we are doing this because it's it's a breakthrough. Yeah, it's 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 Absolutely. the same kind of when Deep Blue with Kasparov in the eighties uh, or nineties, and then the same with Lisa Doll and uh, Deep Mind from Google, um, and the game of Go. You know, it, it's just the next step. And the way I see it, there is no chance for humans in driving uh, it's just a matter of time uh, for the for the car to be faster that does not mean that motorsport is over i have a lot of critics that um, they look at the or they have the vision a very shallow vision of saying ah so uh, you're gonna finish motorsport because the computer will be better than everybody it doesn't work like this we're still gonna be entertained by people racing each other there'll still be go-karts people still play chess and so as people still race horses. So it's not the autonomous driving that's going to finish the sport, but definitely could be a lot of safety embedded in the sport. So imagine that you have a sports car, a new sports car. Even the example of Tesla. Tesla, to show that the, their, their Model S Plaid Plus was very quick, they put a racing driver driving the car in Laguna Seca. I don't know if you saw that. I but imagine that the Tesla puts the car driving itself in Laguna Seca, and then the car reaches a threshold of a lap time that 99% of the humans, they cannot do. So if you want to take your car, if you want to take your sports car, your Audi Tron GT, your, your, take, your Taycan, your uh, Plaid S, and go to a racetrack, the car can be your driver coach. The car can leave you in 100% of controls until you run out of until you run out of talent, is uh, what you say in motorsport, mm -hmm. until you run out of control. And then the car that can take over and take back you home safe, safely. So there is a lot of things that can be used uh, that we are developing robo race that can be later oh, implemented in a sports car, motorsport, and everything else regards especially to safety. So that could like really advance uh, human development of their um, capabilities in a safe manner. 
where they're like, yes. is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, imagine the, the new cars now, electric cars, they'll, they'll be massively uh, powerful. So mm-hmm. 1,000 horsepower, you're going to have su- sub uh, 100K US dollars uh, with 1,000 horsepower cars. So, I mean, not saying that's a cheap car, but a thousand horsepower today, the car costs two million to have it. Mm-hmm. In a few years, uh, it will be under 100k. So it's too much power. It's, you cannot drive that in a in a. You need to be a specialist to drive it. I think the computer and the AI and the and the, and the drive the driving algorithm that we are developing Rover is can help you to have fun with the car in a safely in a safely manner. Uh, that, that's not only it. Of course, then uh, commercial applications the understanding of the threshold of sensors, of the algorithm, energy use, the speed of calculations, and so on. So you're driving both. So that's the robo. So um, robo before race. I go into all this, what's that? that that's RoboRace. I was, I was CEO, yeah. just to clarify, I was CEO of RoboRace between 2017 and 19. Mm-hmm. Uh, and since we moved the headquarters to LA, um, which was in 2019. Uh, I, I'm now only on the advisory on the on the on the advisory board, um, and uh, I'm still, of course, working with them, but not in a daily basis. Yeah, and you're still with Audi, correct? Right, doing innovation with Audi. Yeah. Correct. I'm, uh, yeah. Audi is my um, Audi has a, a team inside Formula E, and I'm contracted by Audi to race the Audi Sport team in the Formula E Championship. Right, and you know you've. So you're in Monaco right now. You're, you're from Brazil. Your family is in Brazil, and and you've been traveling all over the world. But you've got multiple things that you're doing. So you're not only just you were a Formula One racer. You are you doing any of that motorsports at all, or you're completely in the E now? No, completely in the E. So I did Formula One ten years ago, and since then I had uh, very little involvement with F1. Right, and. Most people probably don't even know that Formula E exists. Tell me a little bit about that. Is there? It's growing, right? Like it's becoming a new uh, online sort of race group. Yes. Um, so Formula E is Formula One with the battery and electric motor. So very similar. We race in city centers. And the reason, because it's electric and we, we don't produce so much sound, neither pollution. We can race in cities that has never had that they, they never had a race like that before. For example, New York. So we raced in the center of New York. We raced in the center of Montreal. We raced in Hong Kong, center of Hong Kong. In Paris, we raced 100 meters from the Eiffel Tower in the center of Paris. Uh, Zurich, we had a first race in Switzerland after 54 years. So actually, um, uh, Fungio, I won that race. So Fungio won oh, wow. the previous one in 1954. And then... I won it in 2018, 54 years later. That was the first race ever that Switzerland authorized. Amazing. So m- many of the, 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 and of course, the zero emission, promoting uh, good, uh, promoting clean technology. We have a lot of manufacturers. So we have more manufacturers in Formula E right now than uh, Formula One, IndyCar, Summit. Uh, Formula E has only seven years. That's why you might have never heard of Formula E. It's very young. So most sport franchises, they are very old. They've been there for, decades or hundreds of years like NASCAR or the NFL and, and uh, NBA and so on. Uh, Formula E is very new, so it takes time. It takes time for the passion to, to grow, to, for you to, have your, to, to take your kid there, and then your kid becomes a fan of Formula E. And, you know, it, it takes time, but it's growing very fast. It's the fastest growing motorsport series in the world and uh, I think has a bright future ahead. Amazing. Now, when I find listening, is it quiet? Is it like dead quiet or is no, there actual sound? it's not that quiet. It's oh. not that quiet. But if you imagine it, think about physics for one moment. Sound is basically mechanical energy. So the, the louder you have, the louder engine you have, the more, the more mechanical energy you're wasting in the form of sound. So the, the Formula E actually, it's, it's as silent as possible because you try to get all this energy into the tire, into the ground to accelerate the car, but it's not fully silent. So you can hear it if you're on site. It, it has a very, very high pitch noise because the, the, the motors, they rev, a normal car revs five to 7,000 RPM. Formula E motor revs uh, 35 to 40,000 RPM. So the pitch is Quite a, a hum. It's almost like a jet. Interesting. Oh my goodness. So... Now you've been part of like the the Robo now uh, you know Formula E 
But then there's this other thing I was looking at, which was this e-scooter thing that you're yeah. up to. Tell me about that. Tell, explain what this is. That looks so, absolutely I cool. Mean, for sure, you have uh, you have go you have gone for a ride in oh, yeah. this in this in the scooters that you rent it up yeah. in the e-scooters, electric scooters. I have one. My son, I have a two two and a half year old son. He goes around the house only with his with his scooter. It's not electric, but he goes up and down with that. A lot of the kids now are with the scooter up and down. Uh, Micro mobility, so electric bikes, scooters, and everything, and uh, cargo bikes have become very important in the mobility of the cities and in the road for um, a more sustainable future for everybody. But there isn't, and that quite amazed me a few years ago. Said so there is not a championship for to show the new technologies to push technology the same way as we did with Robo Race. The same way as we did with Formula E, but there is nothing for micro mobility. So me and a couple of other partners here, we we teamed up, put some money down, and uh, we registered around the world and we start developing a super fast electric scooter to become the Formula One of the scooter world and use this championship to promote safety. So to show to kids that the cool is to use a helmet, the cool is to use, you know, to to. In the future, there will be airbags, intelligent airbags in the scooters, but that's something else. But the, the cool is to be safe, and the cool is uh, electric scooters. It, it, it become a new sport. So we started this series. It starts this year with demo races. We already announced uh, two teams. Um, we're going to announce cities soon. U.S. is very interested. Europe, China. We're going to announce um, a few riders also that are part of the the... the the story, but the idea is a world championship with a high prize money for electric, high-speed electric scooter. And the scooter was developed by Williams Formula One. It has 20 horsepower. It reaches speeds. It's limited to around 120 kph, but could reach even higher speeds. So I think oh if, we, if we unplug the scooter and we let safe. it go, it could go maybe 100 miles per hour oh maybe uh, with a scooter. So it yeah, has super powerful. Yeah. They are two by two, so two motors on one motor on each wheel, mm-hmm. super low center of gravity. The tire, special made, it can lean up to 40 degrees angle, like a MotoGP mm-hmm. style rider. You can touch your knee on the ground. So yeah, so this is the new project that I, it's quite, I'm quite excited to, uh, to, have to, to be starting as well. And um, the, the focus of, uh, let's say, from next year onwards will be the, 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 the world championship. You really are the world's most innovator in motorsports. Right. No, thank you with very the future, much. What's going on? It's yeah. incredible. <laughs> just, you know, just, I look at those. Yeah. I looked at those videos, and I'm like, "Do you know when you go bobsledding, and then they have the people go skeletal, like yeah, with yeah. one man? That's yeah. what it feels like when I look at that. It feels like like doing skeleton. It looks pretty sketchy. <laughs> it, it looks. It, it will be. It's extremely difficult because I I, I have a uh, I, I had for a long time. I, I had the first actually. Before the scooters, I had the Boosted board. You remember those skateboards, you know, the yeah. uh, uh, LA company called Boosted. So I bought it in 2014 one, and I, well, I fell in love with it. Then I bought a very powerful electric scooter from Rion Motors in, in, in California also. And the thing is just super agile, difficult. It's physical to ride, uh, and it's super fun. So in our minds, it could create... If we do if we do this proper and we create a grassroots program for the championship, we could create a very very democratic, cheap way and sustainable way of doing motorsports. So instead of going to MotoGP or to to motorsport, this is much cheaper. Uh, an extreme scooter like this, made in you know small batches, they cost less than ten thousand US. So these I'm talking about racing scooters, pure carbon fiber, hydraulic brake discs. Uh, 20 horsepower, um, you know, fully race spec. And if you compare that with the price of anything else in motorsport, it's super cheap. So we think we can attract a lot of uh, a, a, a lot of public. Uh, we're gonna give good prize money. We're gonna promote safety. We're gonna create a. We're gonna race in very um, very dense. We can race pretty much everywhere. So the idea is that we have um, uh, we build this track. We can build and uh, and build very. Uh, very quick uh, with inflatable uh, barriers so nobody gets hurt or as safe as possible. And we can create these races in the city centers of pretty much every big city. Again, New York, LA, uh, Miami, um, 
Montreal, Calgary. We, we could go anywhere, build a track, do a race, fly back. And the carbon footprint of it, it's, it's, it's negligible compared to Formula One or even Formula E because of the logistics. Most of these series, the biggest environmental impact is not the series itself, is the production of the parts and the logistics. This accounts for like 95% of the carbon emissions of series like this. So with the e-scooters, I think we can have more people, more fun, a, a younger audience, um, transmit a better message and promote a better future um, all, all at once. So super excited about this project as well. I'm without words. I mean, you've okay. you know, you found and envisioned not only one, two, three industries, all of them. Yeah, Roborista was not the founder, to be honest. Roborista. Oh, okay, was, you were the CEO. I was the CEO. I, I was yeah. I was brought in very early in the project. I changed a lot of things inside, but I was the CEO for two years. Um, and also, I didn't found Formula E, but also I was there from day zero. I was the third employee, and I helped to shape the the the, the series. Uh, You're but being yes, super I, I, I've been, yeah, I've been, yeah, I've been, I've been, I've been involved in this series from from the very beginning, uh, giving my opinion and my my expertise that I acquired so many years racing. Yeah, I, you're being so modest. The, the, I guess the point I was making is all three of these things. You've been at the very forefront, and you've been part of also envisioning it, but also innovating it. The last thing is marketing it because part of you, everything that you've done is is you've been pr- like seen the progression of what it takes to market. It's a marketing podcast, so that's one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you. Is like you're responsible when I first talked to you about helping market Robo uh, Race, but now you've kind of like um, now got each of these. What is the com? Actually, before I go ask you that question, there's a there's a fourth one, which is Zero Summit. Can you tell people oh, about yeah. Zero Summit? Because that'll tie it all together on the sustainability. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and Zero Summit is a, it's a smaller project, but also a very cool one. Um, I was at Harvard uh, two years ago, and together with uh, some colleagues of mine, um, we, we decided that um, Brazil is such a sustainable country uh, because of our electricity production, because of the Amazon and so on. People talk a lot bad about Brazil, but in the end, it's the most sustainable country big country in the world, our energy, renewable electricity production is 82%. So we wanted to say, we wanted to create the first Latin America, almost like the first world conference that would solely focus on zero uh, carbon emissions, how industries are adapting themselves to new business models, new ways of operating, new ways of uh, product cycles to produce a zero carbon future. Pretty much the same as what the book from Bill Gates are, which is out right now, is exactly that. How we take the road to zero. So I was thinking about the name, uh, and then I show. I looked at the internet, and Zero Summit was available. I said, that's impossible. That zero is available. And was available, so we registered everywhere. And uh, the, the, the COVID pandemic started in the year that we're going to do the first one, the first um, um, event. But we did it anyway uh, with, without public only creating content and only with the speakers. We had an ama- we had amazing speakers for the first one. We had 42 speakers. We had the, the daughter of Ogor. We had the uh, um, ex-secretary of the United Nations uh, and, and many others uh, talking about this future of zero carbon, how we can do that. And the idea is to, to bring ex- experts from different areas, from different countries and different places and put it in the same conference and discuss about this and then show this discussion to the public. Why is it important? How are we going to do that? Who is there a green premium that it's going to be needed to, somebody to pay? Do you need subsidy for this entry? Do you don't need? So Zero Summit is, um, I'm also a co-founder and this is, it's, it's a yearly conference uh, for the discussion of um, zero carbon technologies. That's incredible. So I see that the, the, the lines here are like innovation, marketing and changing an industry. And the other one is the, Desire for sustainability. If I look at all through those three, those three things, where did that all come from? If you go back to the earliest memory of being a, a young boy racing, and what point did that kind of come together for you, where you knew that racing, sustainability, and innovation was going to be kind of your direction? It's a great question, and uh, uh, um, I always, I always, this comes from my father, and I always thought. My father always told me that 
I have to use the expertise and the know-how that I learned during my career during my prof- or, or at my profession to try to change the world to a, to a better future. That's how you create a sustainable business on the sense of being economic sustainable. That's, that's a, a business that needs to stay uh, profitable for the next 50 years. It needs to be sustainable because that's how it is. But my father always says, and, 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 and for me, that was an ethical decision, an ethical and moral decision saying that, how can I use the sport that I love? How can I use motorsport to create a better world? And in the beginning it was safety, which was the clear direction of motorsport. So I created an NGO called Smarter Driving uh, almost 20 years ago. Uh, no, more than 20 years ago. That about 20 years ago, I created this NGO. And the idea was to educate drivers to drive safe with a seat belt. In Brazil, people don't use seat belts. So with seat belts, you know, and respect speed and do stuff like this. And then slowly, when I understood that uh, back in 2011, 2012, that the future is going to be electric, I saw that opportunity. I said, look, I can at the same time continue doing the sport that I love, innovate in that sport. There is a positive technology being developed that is going to make the transportation more democratic, cheaper, better for everyone in, in the short and in the long term. So I have to focus on that. And I started to study a little bit more about uh, the impact of CO2. I always liked... Um, engineering. So I, I always trying to figure out how things work. So for me, I, I try to go, I, I try to go deep into the subject of, of uh, sustainability and it became something which is natural, but I'm not an activist. So I have, I have a lot of requests from activist people around the planet saying, ah, now you have to stop eating meat. Now you have to do that. Why are you flying? Why? I'm not an activist. I, I believe, uh, and actually Bill Gates shares a, a very similar way or I share with him the kind of same vision that we're only going to achieve sustainability if we make um, if we make innovations that are good enough so they are mass accepted by everyone without having to impose anything and without creating costs which are unbearable for the um, uh, the countries which are in economic development like Brazil or India which I visited so innovation technology is in the mobility sector related to motorsport. That was the, my, my thesis, which I, I embraced and trying to see in which areas I could uh, work around that to promote as fast as possible in the best way possible uh, that things that I, that I believe. Amazing. Like, I love that, that backstory with your father. Did you, did you grow up like uh, being like, were you an engineer or do you always like tinkering? Cause you're racing. Sometimes you don't as a create a race driver with someone that's, that's the, you know, interested in the engines as, as much. Yeah. A racing driver have to be a little bit of an engineer because you need to understand, or, or it's, it's very useful to be a little bit of an engineer because if you understand the car, you can make the car perform better and adapt the car better to you. Sometimes the communication with your race engineer is not as clear as if you understand the, 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 the raw or the like the, the, the base of the engineering and then you communicate in that matter to your to your race engineer and um, so yes I think that helped but I always loved engineering I always wanted I always built stuff from I, as, as early as I can remember with Lego then with uh, different stuff and then with uh, uh, air controlled airplanes I bought them modify them so I always had this mentality of trying to improve stuff and trying to build stuff. And it's something which I'm very passionate about. Clearly. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so what about marketing? Like you, you've, been, you've been responsible for being part of launching multiple things. You have four major initiatives that just any one of them is, is big on its own. What could you see if you were to look at across um, all the times that you've been doing this and you've been involved in a high marketed, you know, Formula One and Formula E probably to a certain extent, what have you learned about marketing and industry to get people to adopt this, these changes? Because you're in the forefront of a new category. And I think that because this podcast is around groundswell marketing, it's about how to build a groundswell, how to build support. It's about change and innovation. And you are exactly that person. What have you learned from this that you could share with us that sort of over time you realize to make this to make this sort of like for people to buy into this these are some things that i've learned do you have something you can share 
Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, marketing for a race driver, different from other sports, it's extremely important. As you can see, there are extremely talented in marketing, uh, t- extreme racing drivers, which are also talented in the marketing skills uh, because you need a sponsor, right? So you need to, to create a product of yourself so people sponsor you so you can ac- actually have the best team and race. So the, the different from, uh, let's say, a football player uh, that the team finds the sponsors, pay your salary, you go there and you play and that's it. Racing drivers, they, they have the personal sponsors. Sometimes their salary are totally proportional to how much, how much money they make. For example, Danica Patrick with GoDaddy uh, that paid her whole career. And, you know, it, it, she was an extremely, extremely useful marketing tool for GoDaddy and for that. Many others, you know, uh, pretty much everybody in motorsport. Motorsport is expensive. You need companies there. So I had to learn a little bit during my career how to be, how to try to sell uh, your brand or your identity or the, the product that you're trying to do for different companies. So since very young, you have meetings with C- CMOs, with CEOs in different companies trying to sell, oh, sponsor my go-kart, sponsor this, sponsor that. You're always asking. It's a very difficult s- s- uh, sell um, because the metrics are, they don't really match well. It's very difficult to, to get the ROI. So it, it, I, I learned a lot in motorsport. And uh, to be honest, when I as being part of these companies, which I'm not involved as a racing driver, has been much more easy to sell than uh, actually sponsorships for my racing driver career. So uh, I think if you if you have a, we have a good group of people as well, we have good marketing guys in every of these companies, and um, yeah, I, I've been learning with them. I've been listening carefully, trying to understand how to build a brand. And uh, in the end, it's not my function, but it's an extremely important part of the business. So try to learn as much as you can. Uh, okay, so you, I'm going to go back a step. You just said, I didn't even think of this. So you just gave me a really cool insight. So I never thought of it that way, that the race car drivers are actually have to build their personal brand. And right now, there's a big change in business and marketing where people's personal brands are starting to take shape. And I noticed your personal brand is impeccable. You really weave in all your background, your family, your Audi, all the different initiatives. Like when I, I always feel like I'm, I'm always interested in what comes up in your, in your feeds. And I'm just like, wow, I just, I, it's like, that's good. That's like, you've, you've really mastered your personal brand. If you were to look at your career and other race car drivers, what, what was it to build your personal brand? Like what were the keys to making that successful? Because you're right. Sponsorship. Sometimes it's the, the metrics are elusive. The CMOs are going, well, how do we get our money back? you have to do a pretty good job of sort of like expressing, communicating, and and they have multiple sponsors on, on your on your race car. Tell us about building your personal brand. Like what's that, what, did, what was involved with that? Is it all about races, I guess? Is that the question? Like yeah, the results? I, I, yeah, I, I, didn't ha- I, I didn't have so much professional help. I'm just being myself really mm-hmm. doing that. And looking back, I would have done stuff so much different uh, if I would have, uh, if, uh, if I could travel back, like everybody. What would you do? Tra- so if you could go back in time, what yeah, would you do different? So, exactly. So, um, um, so first of all, a race car driver, you think about as almost every year unemployed by the end of the year, right? It's very hard to have a, a stable contract, a long-term contract. It only happens a few times for a few drivers in their whole careers. And I had a very good chance with Audi. Now I'm with Audi for 10 years. Uh, but before that, I, I always like, I'm not going to invest money. I'm not going to build a logo or a proper website or, re- or create the right content because this might be the last year. And then, okay, I did well that year. And then next year. So I didn't have, like, if I would have go back, I would have uh, structured my personal brand in a more professional way with, let's say, merchandising, with logos, with you know, a proper website that could be, uh, that was like a, a top of the game at the time, which I, I didn't do, uh, or I did it kind of halfway because I never wanted really to invest and put pers- professional people to do that because I thought it was the last year and, okay, now I'm out of F1, I'm going to be unemployed, going to go back to Brazil next year, find something, okay, last year, and then it goes until re- very recently that I said, okay, now I have to do something like, I don't know, five, six years ago, that I have to do something and then like start creating a proper brand. 
but uh, I would have done it more structured. That, that's the answer, short answer. Interesting. And when you were looking at creating, uh, you know, your marketing for these for these companies, and you've woven in the sustainability, the performance, the innovation, what have you learned about um, getting people's full attention? I mean, on one hand, it's innovative, so it's easy to get attention. But more importantly, how do you market so that people start adopting? And and what have you seen? Because you said that now E Formula E is just taking off. What got it going? What was the momentum that got people's captured their attention and, and got the momentum to grow? And and all these actually, for that matter. Yeah, uh, there is a very key defining moment in the early stage of a company, which you don't have credibility enough, so nobody commit, and you need to get the ball rolling. So you need this first big client or this first big sponsor deal. So one of the things that we did in the past and we did with Formula E was not a strategy done by me, actually was done by the, the sponsoring company, which are not disclosed. But they said, okay, we sponsor, but we will take equity in the business because we believe in the business in the long run. So we created kind of a, a feedback loop in which the company which we're sponsoring, which was very important, took some equity out of the business in exchange for the sponsorship. So almost like the sponsorship paid itself because of the increment in the equity or the, the let's say from round series A to series B valuation just because we had that company on board. So that was one way that we used to, um, that we, we, we did uh, in the past and it worked really well. Um, that's an innovation. I mean, if you think yeah, about it, it's like a marketing investment that sustainably keeps growing. That's a, it's got groundswell. Like you're basically, you're, you're investing in something that you have in a potential increase of time. You have the upside, the, yeah. So yeah. by by closing that sponsorship deal, the company valuation would go from, let's say, X to Y or X to 2X, let's say. And then you say, okay, I give you enough equity that in the long term, by by fixing this, this, this contract of sponsorship, the company valuation, only the increment on the company valuation is enough to cover the sponsorship in a way. So it's a good deal for both. If the company keeps growing and you believe in the long term, which you should do if you're sponsoring in the first place, there is a very good way of getting this on board, especially if the company wants to use it as a platform, as an investment. And uh, in this case, some companies, they don't want to mix it up because it's not their core business. But in this case, it was uh, an investment bank and it made a lot of sense. So that's how the ball started rolling and uh, the thing started uh, flying. And then as soon as you get like the first team, the other thing that we do, it's normally we get um, for the first teams committing to a championship, regardless if it's Robo Race Formula E or this Electric Scooter Championship, we give them a better deal because their cost of opportunity is much higher or the risk is higher because they are the first one to commit. So we give them like a progressive deal in which the first ones get a very little fee and the fee starts building up as soon as people uh, have some FOMO of not being in the championship. So you get these first three or four, which are very important to you. And then uh, the thing starts again, snowballing again and more teams wants to join and then you can charge bigger fees at the end. That's an incredible innovation. In fact, I'm working with an insurance company right now that that's sort of what they're doing. They have their franchises investing back into the training, which then actually is going to increase the overall uh, valuation. So it's self-funding, if you will, on the marketing. So that that's kind of one of those things when in marketing is going, well, how, what is sustainable in marketing? Um, you know, like, and, and some people would argue that sponsorship um, isn't sustainable. You just gave an example of actually how it can be. It's the first time I've actually seen a sponsorship model that would be sustainable. That's that's absolutely fascinating. Yeah, what are some of the other hard, innovations? It's a hard one because most of the companies they don't do it uh, yeah. like this. It, it works if it's a company has an arm of investment or mm-hmm. if the owner is a company that has an owner and the owner believes in the series or in the in the in the, in the product and the owner kind of invests the company and gets personal investment on board. It, it's not an easy sell. It's not something that you replicate everywhere. Yeah. But it, it was. It, but it's a good opportunity if if there is something to um, to gain in the long run for for both for both parties when you're in your experience of marketing all the things you've been doing what do you see as the most sustainable marketing thing you can do 
I think the most sustainable thing you can do is uh, uh, to, to define your, your core strategy, to define your brand identity and then kind of stay there and then do not fall for short-term deals that could damage the, the, the image on the long run. So uh, I've said no to many. Uh, actually, I did a pledge uh, one year ago saying that I will not be sponsored by companies which are not uh, um, working to become sustainable in the, in the long run. And I don't associate myself with companies that I don't think they are in the, in the, in the same alignment, or in the same mindset that I have. So I think this, you lose deals in the short run, but I think in the long run, you end up gaining. So being trustful to your cause, uh, finding the right niche or the, finding the right, uh, or finding the, 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 what suits your strategy the best and then sticking to it and then uh, focusing on the values more than the short-term gain. I think that that's the most important thing. I couldn't agree more. In fact, that's my book, Groundswell, is talking about you know being congruent with your values and having a long-term view. And if you can do anything sustainable in anything that you're doing, you're taking a long view. I think that's one thing that I share with you in value is that I'm willing to be very patient and think about what is the long-term outcome versus the short-term gains. And if you were to like in, in me for marketing, I think that's one of the challenges with a lot of businesses and just overall is short-term thinking. What are some of the things that you could say to somebody going, look, you've you're thinking you and I both think the same way. It's like there's so many benefits by being congruent, having values, and thinking long term. What are some of those things that would prov- that we could help them break through so they don't uh, go for those short term things? Like, what are what are some of the things that you've learned that is it just unwavering, solid? You know, you're you're, you're resolute, or is it because um, well, you know? Ha- I have to say that sometimes uh, you you have to depend on the stage that you are in your career or uh, in the position that you are in a specific year, especially, for example, we're talking about the pandemic now, sometimes you have to deal that it might not be congruent to your brand in the long term, but maybe you're not in the right stage of your career that you can only do these deals or mm-hmm. the right stage of the company that you can only do these deals. So it's, it's very hard to ask from people saying, like, you have to do these and even if the food doesn't arrive to your table, you have to be super strict. That's the right mindset. But of course, you have to be rational enough to understand when uh, when to do this, um, when is the extreme necessity of doing these kind of deals. So, yeah, I, I, I don't yeah, have an answer. It's like balancing it's, it's, cash yeah. flow versus long term. Yeah, if you it, don't you have, have any be, gas, you'll never get to the end of the race. If you, if you, my, my, but my point is, if you're looking at the short, if you look at profit, if the profit is not going to change your strategy on the long run, then you focus on your core values and you focus on the long run. If by any time, I mean, in any means, you're going to close your company or you do this deal, then kind of you have to do this deal and then kind of you're going to go back to your normal cash flow, you, st- you stick to your, your core values. But it's, it's very hard to ask when you are not in a time of necessity versus a time of pure desperation. So it's hard to say. Got it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, sometimes short term cash flow needs for businesses are a reality. You got to really zone in on that. You've been you've been in, in in this innovation space, and whenever there's innovation, there's always innovation on top of innovation in my mind. And I'm thinking, what if what would you say? Um, is there anything you've seen that's super innovative in all these different arenas that you're in in terms of marketing? That you're like, you know, there's this one thing we did that was really innovative. Is there anything that comes to mind that you can share that was like? It just feels like when you're like on the edge of robo and and e-scooter and stuff, there's got to be like some incredible new marketing or approaches that you just have never seen in your career. That you're like, oh, that was cool and it worked. Um, yeah, I, I mean, uh, on, on the projects that I've been following closely, um, all the all the innovations that we've done so far is again is to focus on the on how to to get more interaction from people. So I think one of the key aspects of uh, these new sports that we are creating is that people, they don't want to be only spectators anymore. They want to interact more and more with the sport. They want to know the details. Uh, for some fans, you can give them access to, a, the more you give access them to, to content and data, they, they chew on that and they live off of that. So... We've been very flexible. Instead of a very structured, like 
one model fits all customers. We try to, you know, uh, segment the platform. And for example, for the universities in RoboRace, we're giving access to the virtual twin of the car uh, for free. They can model the car. They can race in, in circuits. That you can really go deep and really like in the coding and program the, the algorithm that uh, you want to, to race. And if the algorithm works, actually, we, we, we invite them over to have access to the car. So this interaction and this uh, 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 crowdsourcing initiatives from fans, I think they, it's, it's very valuable. We, probably the biggest innovation, if I have to say one, was the fan boost in Formula E, which is still very controversial. What is it called? Fan boost. Okay. So basically, three days before the race and until the mid of the race, the, the fans, they can vote on their favorite driver. And then during the race, this driver receives a message from the radio saying, you have this extra boost that you can use that the fans voted for. you. So you have like an extra boost that you press and you get, you get another 50 horsepower for five seconds that you can do an overtake if the fans votes for you. So it's, it's, it's one way of interaction. We thought about RoboRace, for example. Uh, so this is, this is happening now. So uh, we had fan boost since season one in Formula E. So a, a massive innovation. A fan can interfere, almost like the fan can choose one player on the field to stay out of the game for like one minute and say, oh, let's vote. I mean, let's get the, 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 the That's crowd crazy. on the I've stadium. never even heard yeah. this. <laughs> yeah, so the fans can really have a small influence in, in mm -hmm. the sport, so they feel part of it. With That's like race, intimacy. Did... Like, pe yeah, like people yeah. are craving this, this intimacy, right? Correct. This is interaction. It's, it's giving this extra bit to the to the to the to the fans. Yes. With Robo Race, for example, we we developed something uh, to for the fans to have interaction with augmented reality on track. So imagine that uh, you're watching a Robo Race race live, and you could throw a ball or a dog or a virtual dog in the track that the car has to avoid. So you, with your smartphone, you could actually, using the, the platform from RoboRace, you could create augmented reality obstacles in the track as the race goes. Uh, so the fans, they interact with the racing in real time. So there, this type of new interaction between fans and sport, I think, which is almost like a gamification of the sport. It's, you go into this, Robo Race is very borderline between game and, and real racing. And, and, and So you're going through a, a mix between esports, um, you know, fans, and it's really a fluid uh, uh, proposal. And I think this is the future, is what this new generation, they love it. And uh, the, the, you need to, to have the to have the vision to go for it and accept the critics, but move on. Amazing. I, that's such a, thank you for that. That's like, I think that's like incredible. Now what you're seeing is that people want to have more intimacy. They want to have connection, human interaction, but actually never thought of like sport and having that influence in real sport and just what the impacts could be. That's just going to generate more of a groundswell of people wanting to really interact and be invested because they're really actually have to be invested in that that's incredible and there so is last pros question. And cons. of course the the con on on it is you want to see who, who wants who wins the bet the best right. without, you want without the sport, the interaction yeah you want the sport to be fair so if there is too much interaction or if even with fan boost is a small interaction but if people are very there is a lot of criticism on the fact that you are interfering with a professional sport. So there mm -hmm. is always this trade-off, which is not very clear at the moment where it's going to go. <laughs> well, I guess we'll find out. You know, it, maybe there's just two different ways. There's fan interaction and, and the, you know, hardcore, you know, without fan interaction or something. Yeah. So the last question here as we wrap up our hour is, you know, let's look ahead. You've, you've been, you already are in the futurist. You're innovating. What's next? What's next for you? And what's, what can we look for in the future? Uh, well, so much stuff I'd like to do. And um, uh, there's so much stuff still needs to, to improve. Uh, I don't know. I, I have a few years more of racing as a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a top level, um, in, a, in a professional level in, the, in Formula E. I'm probably going to stop my, my racing career in Formula E and then focus on my other projects. 
I have had so many different projects that are that are, I'm, I wanted to spend more time. There is this company that I invested, which are creating uh, using autonomous. I, I got to know them because of the connection with RoboRace, but they are using autonomous car technology to give the blind uh, sight again. So the computer vision, that the same computer vision that the car uses to navigate around the roads, they are using to give the blind to navigate around their houses. No way. Yeah, very cool. Very cool technology. So it's it's the same guys that developed the, the autonomous car algorithm um, for self-driving. They are developing this and you can speak. It's like a Alexa. You can say, take me to the bathroom. And the systems recognize it scans the house, do everything, it has LIDAR, sonars, and everything, and guides with sound and haptics the blind around the world. So it's like giving an extra sense back to 40 million blind. So this company invested recently. It's something really cool. Um, there is this, I mean, it's, it's so much interesting on stuff that, happening. On right the now. blind one, like I'm, a good friend of mine is Sean Callagy. He's the um, CEO of the American Blind Association. All right, that would be great to uh, uh, to, to meet him um, and to to introduce this project because he's it's, incredible. Uh, the, the product is ready for commercialization now, and uh, he, they were in stealth mode, but it's. Oh, I was gonna say um, you'll really like him. He's 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 a heart of a lion. The guy actually, I went and uh, spent like three or four days with him, and he surfs blind. No way. Yeah, way. And I, I couldn't believe it. And and I, I he's just an incredible human. And he, I met him through Tony Robbins. And um, we were we shared being plat partners with Tony Robbins. And uh, we became friends. And he's um, doing some incredible things for the blind. So I think that would be a great connection if you uh, yeah, are interested. Yeah, uh, with pleasure. Super I mean, cool uh, the, the technology is so advanced that if you trained enough with this device, you can, you can catch a ball in midair. Wow. Um, yeah, it, it's really, really cool. So this is one example of a, a very interesting project that I did a small investment of on my own, uh, mm-hmm. but there was like good group of guys that I could be more involved. There is all the projects with RoboRace, with Arrival, with this, the company that owns RoboRace, the Electric Scooter Championship. There's so much stuff. And we are living in such an exciting times that, um, you know, Elon Musk is open, opening space. There is these new companies regarding with, with space. Uh, I would like to, to, to help Brazil as well to become, uh, to, to, to be a little bit more developed and organized somehow. So I have, I won't have, for me personally, I won't have any trouble adapting to my life <laughs> post racing. Although it's exciting, it's something that I love racing. So I'm going to do a few more years and then go on into these different projects. No shortage of big ideas. I love it. And I love that your commitment to sustainability, innovation, and just changing industries and being at the forefront of building a groundswell around each of these individual categories and, and new industries that you're putting together. I, I thank you so much for your time on, on the show. Well, thanks, Scott. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. It has been a pleasure. Likewise. And if, if I could just um, let, let people know where you'd like them to follow you. Where would you like people to uh, well, to go? Yeah, either either Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. I'm more active in these four. It's Lucas Degrassi, all of them. Um, yeah, you can see all the content, all the projects I'm working. I'm very open. I post everything myself, and uh, people can contact me through direct messages and stuff. It's it's. Yeah, and really check cool. out his Instagram. It's a, it's one to follow for sure. So thank you again. Really thank appreciate you. that. Thank you, Scott. All right, everyone. Well, that concludes another episode of the Groundswell Marketing Podcast. And, uh, you know, this this whole conversation on sustainability and, you know, just this innovation has just got me sparked with lots of ideas. I, I can't wait till my next episode, but um, this one is going to go down as one of the most uh, interesting ones for season three. So until next time, mahalo. Mahalo.